Hey, welcome. Uh, encouraging to see you, some new faces, and um, welcome to Revelation and um, current events. Another week of really current events. And if you're listening online, welcome. And if you're online after all this has happened, it's not too late. You can look to Jesus and hold on to him um, because he is still powerful to save. Right now, let's pray. Let's ask his blessing and help. Father, thank you that you have the plan, and you want us to know it, that nothing's at risk. You, you are on the way to bringing Jesus to every language, every people, every tongue, every tribe. You're on the way of preparing your people in Israel for the gospel. You're on the way to bring your son back as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And Satan is on the way in his efforts to um, bring his substitute. And we're seeing such dramatic ways. Even in this last week, the conflict has happened. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you who have written this book, that you who have anointed each of us, that you open our minds and our hearts, that you would bring understanding, that you would move through me with clarity and with spirit and truth, and that we would begin to get a greater grasp on what you have said and what you want us to know. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're a speaker, you always bring your book and quote from it. So let me, let me read the first sentence of my, of my book on this. The first two sentences. Did you ever wonder what it would be like to live as part of biblical times and to have your life as part of the story? Wonder no more. You are. One of the important parts of Scripture is this last generation, the generation that's alive when Jesus comes back, is one of the most written about generations in the Bible. Uh, one of the most described um, so it's important for us to get into that because uh, it's about us and about the time and not just about curiosity about uh, what happens and where it's going, but the things we're faced with uh, in dealing with as well. Tonight we want, what, what my goal is this week and next week, uh, we're going to get into Revelation and go through it and it's going to be so easy. When we're going to get there, when we get there, you're just going to, it's going to be so easy. Um, to, because God wants it to be that way. But what we're trying to do, the challenge with Revelation is, is that the arc of God working in history is all coming to its climax and its conclusion. And so what started in the garden with the promise of the seed of the woman who would uh, defeat uh, the seed of Satan and would bring in eventually everlasting righteousness and crush his power, uh, all of that is coming to its climax. Uh, man's rebellion against God, particularly uh, organized after the flood by Nimrod uh, in uh, Babel, uh, which was man's effort to uh, reach the heavens without God. And that is coming to its conclusion in the Great Tribulation is all of this moving towards its ultimate effort uh, to keep Jesus from the throne and to um, destroy the plan of God and bring his will. So all of that is happening in time. God's love for the Jewish people. Uh, God loves you, and, uh, but he loves the Jewish people and he loves Jerusalem. And the culmination of God's plans for Jerusalem and the Jewish people are also all coming to their conclusion uh, and their climax. And then uh, the coming of Jesus uh, to bring his kingdom to earth. So we, we're needing to understand all of those strands um, and to be able to bring that understanding when we go uh, through Revelation. Tonight we want to look particularly uh, at Israel. But to try and give you a little insight into how to look at Revelation, I want you to turn to me over to Revelation chapter 9. Uh, and remember, John is seeing visions. Most of what he's saying is, is what he's seeing. Now imagine you're uh, 90, you know, it's 95 AD. He's probably uh, close to that in his ages. Um, and he's trying to describe 21st century warfare. I mean, he's seen chariots, he's seen catapults, he's seen battery rams, uh, he's seen flaming tar, tar. I mean, so he's, but all of a sudden you're watching, imagine that you're seeing a, a fleet of helicopters uh, that are coming in attack uh, to bring uh, poisoning, chemical poisoning to or violence. Let's go over and see how he does that. In Revelation 9, 7, uh, he's describing this attack that comes from the east. Uh, we're going to see it's China. Uh, it's a nation that uh, has 200 million 
soldiers, as it says in Revelation 9.16, the number of mounted troops were twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard that number because, you know, that's an astonishing, that's 200 million. Now, there was only maybe 300 million people alive in the world when John's writing. Imagine him describing an army of 200 million with the colors uh, of China. But let, let's just look at, over to verse 7 of Revelation 9, of how he's describing what I believe is uh, attack helicopters uh, on the way uh, bringing their attack. He says, And Pyrrhus, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were looked like crowns of gold. And their faces were like human faces. So you're seeing the, the uh, front of the helicopter, and it's, the sun is off it. It looks gold, but there's a human face uh, uh, behind it. Their hair, like woman's hair, their teeth like lion's teeth. So he's seeing this whirling uh, of the helicopter blades uh, on top. And it's, you know, it's, saying it's, like, it's like women's hair just spinning around. And yet it's iron uh, teeth. Uh, they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions and their power to hurt people for five months in their tails, the, the missiles and things that can out from the side. Um, I think for someone describing uh, seeing 21st century warfare with helicopters, I think he's done an amazing job. You know, the globes with the uh, human faces and the hair and the sound. Can you imagine uh, trying to describe that kind of uh, sound that's there? Then if you look down uh, a little bit further, he, he's trying to describe tanks. Now, imagine trying to describe armored tank warfare. You don't even, you know, um, it's just amazing what he would, and, and how God gives him the ability to do that. Uh, it said that the sixth angel, verse 13, blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the river Euphrates will be dried up. Turkey can do that today. They've already uh, enabled, they could dam the Euphrates so there's no water. Um, so the four angels have been prepared for the hour and the day, the month, and the year released to kill a, a third of mankind. Uh, this is the number of the troops, 200 uh, million. Their colors, and this is how I saw the horses in my vision. And those who rode them, they were breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and the sulfur, uh, red and yellow, which China would identify with. The heads of the horses were like lion's head. So how do you describe a tank? <laughs> the heads of their horses were like lion's head. Fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths, for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents. Imagine seeing a turret of a, of a tank. Uh, their tails are, are like serpents with heads, and by means of them, they wound. Um, again, an amazing, I think, uh, job of describing what a tank would look like and how it would be in ways that uh, true to what he's seen, uh, but in ways that would communicate with um, first century um, knowledge uh, in that. So when we come to Revelation, uh, again, it's talking about real, but you have to remember he's seen visions and he's describing what he's seen often. Uh, the, you know, also the unique part of Revelation is he helps us see spiritual beings. Uh, he's saying, well, this isn't, this isn't just some army. These are, these are demons from hell. Uh, so he's helping us see uh, both what's happening in the physical, but he's also helping us see what's happening in the spiritual. Um, so as we begin to as you go through this, uh, again, just keep looking uh, and beginning to get that understanding of how he is communicating what he's seeing, um, both in a spiritual world, which he has unique able to see, but also in the 21st century, what, um, how you relate that to uh, what was happening in the first century. Uh, now, while we're in Revelation 9, one of the things that we're seeing is uh, the rise of wickedness, the rise of evil. Um, let's look at Revelation 9, 20 to 21. 
are the sins of the last generation. Now, this is a seven-year period of time that has a start, a midpoint, and an end. But obviously, it didn't start with the start of the seven years. The rebellion, the focus, what is happening uh, has been uh, growing um, in its development in the rebellion against God. And it says in verse 20, the rest of mankind, so a third have been killed by these, the rest of mankind who are not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worship of demons, the idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So one, uh, idolatry, demons, uh, uh, idols, uh, worshipped, uh, churches full of statues, all, all, all of that. If you go in anywhere in Asia, uh, almost every house has an altar in it uh, to, um, uh, for offerings to be made uh, in each of the homes. You don't go to a restaurant, there's not an altar. Uh, so that, that's there. Uh, but it says they did not repent of their murders. Uh, as I would understand this, this is sanctioned murder. And I would understand this to be abortion. That um, if you see any real passion in the democratic debate, it's about the right for women to kill their babies. Abortion. You know, this year so far, uh, in, in the world, 34 million babies have been aborted. 34 million. Uh, the U.S. has seen a significant reduction, but that reduction is down to like 600,000. Um, so as they are seeing the judgment of God coming, they refuse to repent of their sanctioned murders, um, which I would understand to be uh, abortion. Or their, their sorceries. Um, this is where we get the word pharmacy. Now, in the first century, they believed that there must be a spirit in drugs because the spirit of people changes. So the sorcerers were skilled at mixing chemicals for um, change in mood uh, and attitude in action. And so uh, what it's talking about is drug use uh, that's there. Uh, and what we are seeing in our day, $150 billion in the American economy goes every year to illegal drugs. You know, as you look at Mexico, as what you saw this week, where um, by uh, arrest warrant for a drug leader of Chapman's son, uh, Chapel's son in Mexico, um, they unleashed this violent attack on military and the police that were there, and they let him go. They actually released him, let him go, because they didn't, couldn't withstand the assaults of uh, the drug people there. Well, um, if you dried up American drugs, you would dry up Mexico's cartels. We're, we're, our money uh, is feeling that. So they wouldn't give up uh, their, uh, their drugs uh, that were there, their use of drugs. They wouldn't give up their sexual immorality. Um, as we see the aggressiveness of, of homosexuality, transgender, queer, I mean, what are all the, <laughs> yeah, uh, in that is, uh, you know, it isn't that homosexuality in a percent of people's participation is so much higher, it isn't, but it is the uniqueness of Romans 1 says that society reaches the bottom when that sin is out in the open uh, and declared to be right. And, uh, you know, one of the presidential candidates, Democratic candidates, thought that churches should lose their right to take tax donations, uh, tax free, uh, taxable donations, if they support an anti gay agenda, anti gay stand. That's not happening, but that's, that's where we're at uh, in, in the day. So they wouldn't repent of their sexual immorality. Uh, or their thefts, no respect of property on violence. And so as we look at that, and you know, 2 Timothy 3 says the last days will be terrible times. You think, why? Earthquakes and famines and wars? And... No, it would be terrible because of how we treat each other, because it will be the love of self, the love of money, and the love of pleasure, and the love of religion, who have uh, a form of godliness, but without its power. So as Revelation is describing this, 
um, we are seeing that in its reality before us. And uh, they won't repent now. And even when they know God's judgment is coming of that, they will not repent. Uh, you're going to see, and, and maybe that struck you. Have you read through Revelation this week? Yes, all right. Timid hands. <laughs> uh, uh, but you'll see, after so many judgments, it says, and they refuse to repent. And they refuse to repent. And they refuse to repent. Because what it, what it is is um, our rebellion against God and our wanting sin and pleasure um, more than we want him. And we have a form of godliness but not its power, because its power comes through obedience from the yielded heart to live with the Spirit of God, uh, living out the Word of God. So we're seeing that, that strand uh, is there uh, and evident uh, before us. Now, we want to look at Israel and where we are in that arc of history with Israel. Uh, so let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 36. And bring us back to what began in the latter part of the 19th century. Over to Ezekiel 36, and then we'll look at the, uh, the vision he has in Ezekiel 37. Um, Ezekiel 36 begins with God talking to the land. <laughs> He's talking to the land. Um, and, and you, son of man, verse 1, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. And say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy said of you, aha, and the ancient heights have become our possessions, therefore prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God, precisely because they made you desolate and crushed you from all sides, so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations. You became the talk and evil gospel of the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Uh, thus says the Lord God to the mountains and the hills, the ravines and the valleys, the desolate waves, deserted cities, which have become a prey and derision to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus says the Lord, surely I have spoken in my hot jealousy against the rest of the nations, against all of Eden, which would be um, where Jordan is, uh, who gave my land to themselves as possession. So uh, God starts out with talking to the mountains. Uh, and what has happened, uh, if you go back to the 19th century, uh, the area of Israel, Palestine, is under uh, Ottoman, Turkish control, uh, and they've had it. Uh, the mountains of Israel have been deforested, uh, therefore, and the land is mostly swamps, and because of the being deforested, it changes the weather, it's swampy, it's um, you know, mosquitoes and bugs, and it's a desolate place uh, by neglect uh, that's happened. But uh, there was a movement starting in it. Well, let me go a little bit further into the prophecy. Down to verse 16. The word of the Lord came to me. The Son of Man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways, their deeds, their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they shed in the land, for the idols with which they had defiled it. I scattered them among all the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries. In accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name. And that people said of them, these are the people of the Lord. And yet they go out of his land. But I, have a con I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. So because of their sinfulness and their rebelliousness, uh, God has dispersed them among the nations. But wherever they've been, wherever Jewish people have been in the world, they've been a distinct people. Uh, they've always stood out uh, where, where they are. And they are the people of Abraham. They're the people of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And so that wherever they have been, they have dragged the name of God because he must not be the powerful God because these people are uh, dispersed and discriminated against and um, you know, one of the things Jewish people learn is that sooner or later, every society turns on you. Um, and the first ones to really grasp that uh, was Russia, which is historically one of the most anti-Semitic uh, nations long before communism and Putin, they, um, uh, they were there. So, so, so you've carried my name there. Therefore, verse 22, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, 
that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you profane among the nations in which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which is profaned among the nations in which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord Yahweh, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the countries, and bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols, and I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey all my rules. So it's talking about lives transformed by Jesus Christ, by their hearts changed, by the Holy Spirit coming to indwell them. So I'm going to call you back from the nations, back to the land, and I'm going to do a work in your hearts to transform and to change you, uh, put my spirit within you, and you're going to dwell in the land. So there's the promise. Now, um, let's pick it up. I'm, going to, I'm moving to the vision of, uh, in 37, but let's, let's pick it up in verse 37 of Ezekiel 36. Thus says the Lord God, This also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them to increase their people like a flock, like the flock for a sacrifice, like the flock at Jerusalem during her point of feast, so that waste cities shall be filled with the flocks of people, and that uh, they will know that I am the Lord. So he's going to repopulate the land. And he talks about it will be like when the big feasts are going on. And in Jesus' day, uh, the big feast time, like, like Passover and all the others, they might have a million people in Jerusalem. Uh, that's what Josephus, the historian, said. So, um, People from all over, Jewish people from all over the world there. So it can be like that, uh, only it, it, it won't, it won't um, end. So we come to verse 37, we, or chapter 37. We see a vision uh, of Ezekiel being asked to look at a valley of dry bones. And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. So not only are they dead, they're long dead. Uh, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Is it possible for these to come alive? Now, Ezekiel is a wise prophet. And he says, and I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. <laughs> uh, very wise at this point uh, in what he's saying. And then he said to me, well, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So this long dead nation, remember we saw the last time Israel was together as a nation, all 12 tribes, uh, was 900 years before Jesus was born. And the last time any were in Jerusalem, uh, uh, any form of the nation as Judah with Benjamin uh, was finally carried away by, um, in, by Babylon in 585. So but what he's talking about, this reborn nation, we haven't seen since uh, almost over 900 years before Jesus was born. So what are the likelihood of that, uh, of that happening? And now notice what happens when he prophesies, because the prophecy is fulfilled in two steps. Uh, that's where a lot of critics get lost today. So, so I prophesied, verse 7, as I was commanded. And I prophesied, as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, behold, there were sinners on them, and flesh had come to them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. So they're alive. They're uh, living, uh, a real nation, uh, existing, but they aren't a spiritual nation after God. Uh, so that's the first part. Prophesy, the bones come to life. Uh, we saw that in 1948, Israel reborn as a nation by UN uh, mandate. Uh, and then in 1967, uh, in the war to drive them into the sea, they took over Jerusalem, what's now called the West Bank, the, uh, Israel over to the Jordan River and Dead Sea uh, in that uh, area. But a lot of people have looked, even at Rolling Hills, and said, well, but they're not a spiritual nation. That, this can't be it. Uh, well, wait a minute. No, it's two steps. Uh, first, uh, establishing as uh, a nation. 
But as Ezekiel says, there was no breath in this, the phrase they would be using for the Holy Spirit. There was no spirit in them. They weren't a spiritual nation. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, uh, an exceedingly great army. So uh, he says to the Holy Spirit, stop going to the four winds. Come back to Israel. Uh, and uh, let Jesus, uh, the gospel be preached there, and they will come to spiritual life. Now, if the church is here when that is happening, how does the Holy Spirit stop going to the four winds when that's where we are? Uh, in doing that. And it brings us back to the reality the tribulation isn't about the church. Uh, the seven-year period of time is about the second half of Ezekiel's vision. It's about bringing the gospel to the Jewish people, uh, which you have been seeing in Revelation 11, the two witnesses. 144,000 have come in the first three and a half years once they're sealed, uh, and then they're protected the last three and a half years. And they represent Israel when Jesus comes back. Uh, so that as a nation, they belong to Jesus and they are looking to receive him as the king because you're seeing in Revelation, for the rest of the world, they grieve when Jesus comes back uh, because uh, it's, it's for their judgment. So we're in that two phases. Now, God's working in Israel. There's people coming to faith in Christ, uh, but certainly not in anything but small percent, certainly not uh, as a nation. So now, why do I say this is Israel? Well, you say dry bones, and you know, why do I say that? Well, remember the Bible always explains the symbols, always. And there, you don't have to wait long. Verse 11. Then they said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Okay. How long do you have to study scripture? And this is apocalyptic, and it's visions and dry bones. How will we ever figure it out? Well, you only have to wait a verse. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. They are prophesying, say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I put my spirit within you, so that's, uh, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, then you shall know that I am the Lord have spoken, and I will do it. The Bible is a book of prophecy. God declaring the future, bring it to pass, uh, declares the Lord. And then verse 15, uh, because there were 10 tribes carried away, uh, called the lost tribes. Uh, so what, what's this new Israel going to look like? Uh, what about the 10 lost tribes? Well, God's pretty good at figuring things out. Uh, and he said, verse, six, verse 15, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take a stick and write on it, for Judah and the people of Israel associated with him. Then take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel associated with him, which is the ten tribes, and join them together in one stick, that they may become one in your hand. And when your people say to you, will you not tell us what these mean? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm about to take the stick of Joseph, that is the land in the hand of Ephraim, who led the ten uh, and the tribes of Israel searched with him, and I will join with it the stick of Judah, and I will make them one stick, that they may be one in my hand. Um, so what is happening in this seven, first three and a half year period is God joining together uh, the tribes. Uh, and we'll see when we get into Revelation 17, um, 144,000, 12,000 from every tribe, but Dan, right? Because Sorry, Dan. <laughs> Dan was the first tribe to introduce idolatry uh, to Israel. Notice down in verse 24 that Jesus will be their king. Uh, my servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. So Jesus came uh, in the line of David. They shall walk in my rules, be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I give to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children, their children's children, shall dwell there for how long? Forever. And David, my servant, should be their prince forever. So Jesus will be welcomed as the King, Messiah, uh, Lord, Savior uh, of Israel, and he will rule them with the church uh, first in the thousand years uh, I reign on earth, and then uh, forevermore I will make my covenant peace to them, verse 26. It should be an everlasting covenant with them. 
so there's nothing to fear in the future when, uh, when this happens. So the gospel now, Jesus said, go take the gospel to all nations, uh, to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit there taking it to the four winds. Uh, as we said uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, when they assessed how that's happening, they realized in 1989 by a mission group out of, Ralph Winters group out of Pasadena, that there were 18,000 more people groups not yet reached with the gospel, not having a witnessing church uh, with, as part of that people. Um, they counted it up again last year, and it's gone from 18,000 to 500. Uh, there have, and all of this is happening with intent because they figured out who are these unreached people. Uh, they divide them up. What are the big groups? And some missions focus on the big groups. What are the small groups? Some uh, missions focus uh, on the small groups. And we're seeing the fruit of that. But there's a point at which that ends. Because he tells the Holy Spirit, stop going to the four winds, come back to Israel. Uh, that's when the church goes home. Uh, and the seven-year period starts with the two witnesses coming uh, with a peace treaty made with Israel by the uh, surrounding nations coming out of, as we'll see next week, out of uh, revived Rome, uh, European Union, uh, to bring that, that rule there. Um, and Satan's rebellion begins with this leader who appears to have had a fatal wound uh, but recovers and the leader of the church leading Judaism and Islam as well. Because this is the man of destiny for us to lead the world. Uh, so there, there, there's the picture. Uh, and so where are we at? Well, we're at that part of God bringing the Jewish people back to the land. Um, and it started uh, in the 19th century. It started in Russia. Uh, remember, uh, Jewish Palestine at that time, Israel was under Ottoman control. Um, wasteland, not desirable. But... Um, what was always said at the Jewish home was, next year, Jerusalem. And in the late in the 19th century, because there were po pogroms that would happen in Russia where um, Jewish neighborhoods would be invaded, raped, burned, murdered, uh, in just repeated cycles. They were always the cause for the problems. And, uh, so there was a group of um, youth who grew up saying, we're not, we're not saying next year, we're going. And began this journey uh, from Russia down to, uh, uh, to the land. Uh, it was called um, the birth of Zionism. Remember, Zion is one of the five hills that Jerusalem is built upon, and Zion is where David's throne was established. Mount Moriah is where the temple was, where Jesus was crucified on the black side of it. Um, Zion is where David. So this uh, idea of bringing again a nation um, back to Israel started. But uh, Jewish people in Europe who were doctors and physicians and bankers and all, all the rest of that, well, that's fine, but life is fine here. And so uh, it just began as this kind of small movement was there, and there was some interest uh, in Europe, and then came Hitler, um, who wanted to eradicate the Jewish people from earth uh, and kill. Why? Why, why is there anti Judaism? Because Satan knows salvation is of the Jews. He knows the last chapter. He thinks he can change it. He's the ultimate egotist. But he knows that last chapter. And so that hatred of the Jews, which has no explanation in who they are or what they've done, but anything but a demonic kind of hatred and just um, uh, that's there. And they're always controlling. There's a small amount of Jewish that are controlling the events in the world. And, you know, all of that is there, all part of um, Satan's work. So uh, after World War II, um, when the U.S. turned its back, we knew what was happening. We refused to take um, Jewish people to the States. Um, uh, so it was this silent conspiracy by all around. Uh, but by mandate, uh, Great Britain had gotten control of the area uh, after World War I. Uh, when the Ottoman Empire was defeated, was on the wrong side. Uh, and so there was, the British were over that in and, and their mandate and allowing Jew, Jewish people to come. And then when World War II ended, which should have been the, the worst moment ever for people uh, who were Jewish because of six million died and 
all of the world had turned their back. It was out of that, and the most improbable of all things that happened, Israel was born. Um, by British, you wouldn't let them come back. Remember, you'd seen Exodus, maybe the movie, and that's a long time ago, but uh, no one was for them. Certainly not the area. Britain wasn't, but they just forced themselves. And in 1948, the UN established them. Uh, Britain walked away. They thought they would last a week. Uh, they thought there's no way you're going to stand up against all of the uh, Islamic world that's around you. Um, so you want your land? Okay, you got it. We walk. Uh, and um, if there's anything that shows the providence of God and his ability to, against all odds, bring his will to pass, and what he declared to happen, uh, it's, it's the story of, of Israel. And this uh, bringing them back to the nations uh, has gone in phases. Uh, when the Soviet, we said this a couple weeks ago, but when the Soviet Union collapsed uh, and suddenly all of these other nations were birthed and Russia was formed, uh, it became an opportunity for the Jewish people to leave this land that has always been against them. And what happened in the 1990s is that a million uh, immigrated from the former Soviet Union to Israel. All of the issues of you know, putting housing into occupied territories. And uh, one of the presidential candidates said yesterday that uh, if Israel keeps building uh, into the territories, I'll cut off all foreign aid. I mean, it's just interesting how this layout is the dynamic uh, in, in so many places. Uh, the last wave of uh, hostility uh, against Jewish people happened in France uh, in the horrible killings that were there. And France is the latest wave of Jewish people that says, there's no safe place in this world for us. Uh, France will not. And the Islamic uh, influence that spread throughout Europe by the immigration uh, and the deadness of any other spiritual force that is there has changed the dynamic there. And just another wave. There's a wave from Northern Africa uh, that came. And that's the continual um, battle Israel has to provide housing and, and all the rest of that. Uh, is they're, they're not just expanding out uh, into what's called the occupied territories because they uh, want to establish their political muscle. They need places for people to live uh, in, in a change. And there's justice issues to that. We're not going to uh, get into that. But this is God's work. You can't explain this apart from the hand of God. And who prophesied this? We're reading Ezekiel, you know, what, 700 years before um, Jesus was born. Talking about today. And that I will bring them back to the land. And now waiting for uh, the final, uh, the tribulation to start when the two witnesses come. Now we get into Ezekiel 38. And uh, to this land is a threat. And um, so let's, let's look at that, because it's today's headlines. Uh, so he says in Ezekiel 38, When the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. These are all where Russia comes from. And prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaw, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host of all of them with buckler and shield, wielding, wielding swords. And here's going to be your allies. Persia is who? Iran. Kush uh, and, and Put um, are uh, Libya and um, ancient Ethiopia, which would be today Sudan, uh, joining with them. Um, so it's Iran, Russia, and then the other groups, Beth Tugamash and the others, are Turkey. So that I'm going to bring Russia, Iran, Turkey to come as the threat to Israel. Well, what's happened in the last week? Iran and Russia have been in Syria. Um, uh, Russia has had over 63,000 troops there. They have uh, established full bases, military, uh, uh, air, and uh, armored, and naval. 
Uh, Iran is there with their advisors, hidden numbers uh, uh, of what they're there. Uh, Turkey is moving. Guess where Erdogan, the head of Turkey, is going this week? He's kind of not coming to Washington. Where's he going? He's going to meet Putin. What happened when the U.S. pulled out, and is still in the process of pulling out, is that the Russian forces there this last week have occupied the U.S. bases. They've walked in. Uh, 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 and, and, uh, which uh, is, to, I think, to the shame of, of this country, but it's, it's inevitable. Uh, we're going to see uh, next week, we're going to look at the USA and uh, where it is in prophecy. But one of the um, challenges that people have looked at current events and saying, well, you know, where's the USA in all of this? Uh, why, uh, why wouldn't they be a player? And we'll see in Revelation 18 what, what their play is. Um, but our influence in the Middle East is, is empty. Our president said it's just sand. These are sand and border issues. What does that have to do with us? Uh, and during that, well, who's rushed in? Is Russia, Turkey, Iran. Uh, that's there. And uh, so he says, be ready. Verse 7, be ready, keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. Uh, and now that they are going to invade uh, Israel, uh, let's pick it up in uh, verse 14. Therefore, send a man, prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on the day when my people Israel are dwelling securely, will you not know? You will come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, and many people with you, all of them riding on horses, a great host, a mighty army, you will come up against the people of Israel like a cloud coming to land. In the latter days, I will bring you against my land, that the nations may know me, <laughs> when through you, O God, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Um, thus says the Lord God, are you he, uh, he of whom I spoke in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who in those days prophesied for the years uh, that I would bring against them, and God bringing his judgment on Russia uh, for their years of anti-Semitism uh, and defiance of God's people. Um, now, Israel is living at peace when they're invaded. It will say uh, a little bit later, they're living in unwalled cities. Now, what has happened in Israel since the uprising called the Intifada, uh, um, what, has happened, what has happened in Israel? They're living in walled cities. If you go to Bethlehem, and uh, there's this huge wall all the way around the Palestinian areas uh, to Jerusalem. You go around Jerusalem, there's this big wall because um, they could not find anyone within the Palestinians who would keep terrorism from coming. So they said, okay, we're going to wall you off. But there's going to someone come with a peace treaty that leads uh, Israel to um, disarm and come at peace. Now, that's pretty dramatic from where they are now, but they're still right now today trying to form a government. Uh, Netanyahu has uh, said, I can't do it. So now the blue-white party is, now has the chance to do it, uh, and um, they have 28 days to form a government, uh, and if not, they're going to have to go back to a new, new election. So um, they're pretty much in the sea without an anchor. Uh, as, as, as what is happening. Um, so what if, hap what if there was someone who would rise up with a peace treaty that would bring peace to the region? How would you do that? What if you declared Jerusalem to be uh, a holy site for all three of the major religions? That you can have, Israel, you can have a temple. Uh, Islam, you can keep your uh, Dome of the Rock. Uh, Christians, you can have your sites. We're going to uh, last year, the Pope, uh, representatives of Judaism and Islam, met together and resolved, we all worship the same God, we all come from Abraham. Uh, why, are we, why are we fighting? Why are we evangelizing each other? Uh, let's, let's resolve to come at peace. So this already is happening uh, and, and on the way. So when, when does this happen? So Israel is in unwalled City, so as we go to Ezekiel 38, 39, they're at peace um, and that, that it comes. So uh, now notice what happens is when you get over to Ezekiel 39, we'll see that 
part of this is nuclear. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, let's, let's pick it up. Uh, verse 13, all the people of the land will bury them and will bring them renown on that day. I show my glory. So they're having to be regarded as courageous for burying. Uh, why, why would they be courageous for, for burying? I show my glory, declares the Lord God. They will set apart men to travel through the land regularly and bury these travelers remaining on the face of the land so as to cleanse it uh, at the end of seven months. So for seven months, they're looking for um, what I believe are radioactive people. When they travel through the land and anyone sees a human bone, he shall set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of uh, Ham and Gog, uh, Ham and Oaths. Thus shall they cleanse the land. And you said a man, thus says the Lord God, speak to the birds of every sword and all the beasts of the field, assemble and come and gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I'm preparing for you, a great sacrificial feast on the mountains of Israel, and you shall eat flesh and drink blood. Uh, you shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princess. So when does this happen? When does uh, Russia, Iran, Turkey, uh, Sudan, Libya, when do they join together to come against Israel? Where do we see that uh, in our sequence of where we are now, whenever the tribulation begins, those seven years? Um, I, I think, as we'll see here, um, that this is in the second half of the tribulation, that part of what happens when the Antichrist declares himself to be God uh, and all of you have to worship me, this is when things fall apart. And the first one to uh, oppose that is China and the kings of the east who come from the east uh, uh, against Israel. Now remember what we're going to see in Revelation is that for, uh, what is it? Uh, I mean, 80 miles, I think it is, that blood is up to the bridle of a horse. So the bloodshed that's happening there. As part of this, uh, it seems when Russia, Iran, makes their launch as well, uh, all coming down to part of what's called the battles of Armageddon, because we see this ends with the glory of Jesus. Uh, verse 21, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment that I have executed and my hand that I have laid on them. The house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. And the nations shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they dealt so treacherously with me. I hid my face from them and gave them into the hand of their adversaries and they fell by the sword. I dealt with them according to the uncleanness and transgression and hid my face from them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will restore the house fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. They shall forget their shame and all the treachery they have practiced against me when they dwell securely in the land and none to make them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them from the enemies of the lands and through them have vindicated my holiness in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God because I set, sent among them into exile among the nations and assemble them into their own land. And I will leave none of them remaining among the nations anymore. And I will not hide my face anymore from them. I will put my spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. Now this is where uh, people who look at this disagree. Uh, some people see this happening uh, to precipitate the peace treaty. That Russia and Iran may at any point uh, rise up to try and take Israel. Uh, and this arouses the world uh, to come in and stop that and to bring in uh, the peace treaty. Um, others see it, as we're right here, in the second half of the tribulation. It's part of the falling apart of the coalition built among the nations of the world. Um, as Satan could never bring uh, unity uh, that's there, and it's part of uh, this um, final series of battles called Armageddon. Uh, and you'll see in other parts of prophecy dealing with this time of um, which seems to be radiated soil and avoidance of it. Um, and so it, to me, it, it's happening as, as he says here in, in 39, it ends with the reign of God. Uh, and if it ends with the reign of God, that's not the start of tribulation because that's the uh, most vocal protest against God, or a substitute for God, who's there. 
Um, so, but it's significant um, because now the major international player in the Mideast is no longer the United States, it's Russia. And um, uh, how are we going to build loyalties when we have pledged ourselves to the Kurdish people uh, who have died in the fights as our surrogates in the battle against ISIS and uh, to the tune of 11,000. Uh, Israel is incredibly nervous uh, as to um, the reliability of us uh, securing anything, which is while they'll be looking for uh, somewhere else to secure the future uh, than us. Um, um, you know, I've, I've written some of this you know, back in 2000. So this isn't political. This isn't about who's president. This isn't about, uh, it's just describing what's happening uh, and putting that into what, what the Bible uh, talked about uh, and prophesied. Um, but it's just incredibly significant what's happened the last week uh, with uh, Russia rushing in, U.S. going out, um, Kurdish people now being forced back to um, Assad with Syria, one of the most um, evil generation, what they've done, gassed their own kids. Uh, it's just uh, incredible. And people that thought we would be with them. Uh, so many American soldiers that have fought beside them are just aghast um, about what's happening. But no surprise to Ezekiel. No surprise to God's description uh, of the future um, that's there. So there we are at, uh, with where we're at till today. Um, Turkey, uh, tremendously insulted by a letter the president sent. And, you know, this, the Mideast, you don't shame face people. You don't call them fools if you do this. Um, so it's, it's going to have lasting consequences. Uh, if you read some of the commentators from Russia, they just can't believe it. It says, like, Putin won the lottery. Didn't have to do anything. He just walked out. Left the bases, we walked in, uh, in terms of that. And what, what the pressure is, is not just, it's not just sand, it's the oil, uh, which is still a key part of world economy, as well as uh, trade that comes from uh, Asia up to the Persian Gulf and all. So uh, it's still critical economically uh, that there is stability uh, in the Mideast. There uh, was an Iranian, Iranian uh, oil facility uh, exploded yesterday. Uh, huge balls of flames. Um, the, the rumors are it's Saudis who have gotten back to them for attacking. Uh, but, but Iran has said, no, it's just, just some oil in a ditch that caught on fire. It's just massive. So um, it's happening. Uh, but we as a country are not an influence. Uh, we have um, stepped away and worked out of that exactly uh, as uh, the Bible has uh, foretold us. So there we are to today. Uh, Israel's still migrating back, um, still huge issues. Um, one, of the, one of the most densely populated places in the world. You go to Gaza, it's just unbelievable. Tremendous, um, you know, you wouldn't want to be a Palestinian in Israel. Uh, there are issues that, um, you know, are, are not just Israel's right and therefore everything they do is right. We wouldn't say that. There are things that uh, need to be there. But what's happening is, is a movement of God. And um, evangelicals are blamed uh, for how the Palestinians are treated because we've supported Israel. And they have oppressed Palestine. So it has a lot of spiritual dynamic right now. And uh, as so much of the rest of the church isn't believing these are the last times, isn't believing Israel is with the moment of God, uh, now so much of the church now is making it a Palestinian justice issue uh, in that without um, with a blindness to, well, you're fighting history. You, we couldn't make it happen. And we can't stop it from happening. God's will is going to happen. And doing it, but certainly as God's people, we want to be on uh, the right side of history. All right, then we'll come back to uh, more of that next week as we look at um, the economic Babylon, uh, political, um, religious Babylon, and political Babylon 
um, that's there. Right now, what I want to take you to is, and I don't want to lead you where we're at. So let's go over to Leviticus 23, and let's look at Leviticus. These are the seven feasts, Sabbath and the seven feasts. I will have notes for you next week with this part. Uh, so uh, take it in, but uh, we'll have the details. In the, in the Sabbath and the seven feasts are the prophetic picture of Jesus and his work. And um, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law. What did he do? I came to fulfill it. Uh, and the Sabbath uh, and the seven feasts that were the uh, cycle of, of a year for Israel are all prophecies uh, of Jesus fulfilled with him. Uh, so we want to go through those um, and to bring that perspective to, and also it brings its perspective to time uh, and the rapture in the church as well. Uh, so first, uh, verse 3 of Leviticus 23 is the Sabbath. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. So, it's a day of rest. The Sabbath was the last day. It starts at sunset Friday and goes to uh, sunset uh, on Saturday. It was a day of worship, a day of rest, uh, no cooking, no working, uh, rest, worship, uh, enjoy. Stop your labors uh, and, and, and rest. And in Hebrews 4, 9 to 20, 16, Jesus is our Sabbath. He's our rest. We no longer have to work to satisfy the requirements of God because we can't. And Jesus has brought to bring us rest, uh, that he has satisfied the law in how he lived. He has satisfied our judgment in taking it on the cross as representing us uh, and then rose in victory. So we are working for our salvation. You know, Philippians, when it, when it says, uh, it doesn't say uh, work for your salvation. It says what? Work out. You're saved. Now you're, you're working out. It does have trust. It has obedience. We have uh, our responsibility, but, but we're resting in that. And that was the, in the Hebrews 3 and 4, they contrast two generations, the Moses generation and the Joshua generation. And the Moses generation never rested. They never trusted God. Every time they faced a new obstacle, oh, we're going to die. You brought us out here to die. What well, would they were back in Egypt or you know, we're, gonna, we're here, and now Pharaoh's army is going to kill us. And then they, got, they say there, and then we don't have any water, and then they know we're going to die of thirst. Better than our children back in Egypt than God provided. And we don't have any food. The food ran out. And, you know, it's just every time they met a challenge, it was met by complaint and fear. They never trusted. Never trusted. Uh, and that's when they got to the point of going to the promised land. They didn't. The Joshua generation. Learn that God is able, that he is the warrior. Um, and the first battle they had was for Jericho. And who meets Joshua before the battle of Jericho? It's Jesus, commander of the Lord's army. Uh, here's Joshua said, you're going to have victory wherever you go. You're going to have victory. And he's coming to Jericho. How am I going to do this? He meets Jesus, commander of the Lord's army, because he's called the commander of the Lord's army, but he's told to, you're on holy ground, fall, uh, fall, at, your, uh, fall at my feet. Uh, and, uh, and so Joshua says, well, are you for me or against me? You know what he says? Neither. I'm not for you or against you. That's not the right question. I'm coming as commander of the Lord's army. Are you on my side? And that's when Joshua's on his face, yes. And he gets the battle plan of marching around uh, this Jericho with the Ark of the Lord before and the peace priests with their trumpets, uh, silently, six days. And then on the seventh day, march around it seven times. Well, what's the seventh day? It's a Sabbath. They have just had the law read to them. They've just committed themselves to live by the law. And the first battle they're having is on the Sabbath. Why? Because the battle belongs to the Lord. Rest in his power. 
Um, and that's what Jesus has come to do. We, we have come to have rest before God. We have come to believe that our sins, not in part, but the whole have been nailed to the cross and we bear it no more. That we have a righteousness before God that doesn't make us perform um, for God, but makes us love him, and walk with him, uh, and live out by the power that he gives. So Jesus is our Sabbath rest. And then they go to the seven years, uh, seven feasts over a year cycle, the first one starting um, with Passover. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, verse 4, the holy convocations which you should proclaim at that time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy conversation, convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. You should present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. And the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no, not do any ordinary work. So the first two, first is Passover. Uh, judgment is coming to every home. Uh, death is going to come to every home. Jewish, Egyptian, great sinners, fairly righteous people, coming to every home. Except those covered by the blood of the Lamb. Because the, when the angel of judgment can have come, he's only going to look at what? The blood. Could be Jews, could be Egyptians, could be great sinners, could be fairly good people. All he's seeing is the blood. Uh, and Jesus, uh, at the time when the Passover lamb was being prepared for that evening meal, was when he was crucified on the cross at the exact time. And John introduced him uh, as the Passover, uh, as the Lamb of God who came to take away sin. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5. Again, we'll have notes on this next week. Uh, call him the Passover lamb, uh, pass, the Passover. Uh, so on the exact day, I mean, this is one of the things we're going to have to see in these feasts. They've all happened on the exact day. He died when Passover lambs um, were being sacrificed uh, to prepare the blood on, on the doorpost. That started the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leaven is uh, yeast. Uh, and that they were to search their house and get rid of all leaven. It's a picture of sin because uh, like yeast, when it gets into the uh, dough, it, it, it impacts everything. Uh, we actually were in Israel one year during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You could not get anything but matzah breakfast and, uh, because they, they, uh, that's uh, how they, they observed that feast. And, and Jesus says, I'm the... I'm the, I'm the bread. He's the one who enables to make us holy before God. He's the one who's able to present us as if we had no sin because he is our unleavened bread. And so um, on that day uh, that started, Jesus fulfilled that through the cross. Uh, John 6 in the pivot point with the crowd saying, you, you're coming for miracles, but you need to know I'm the, I'm the manna. I'm the bread. You need to eat of me and drink of my blood. Uh, that's there. So he has introduced the unleavened bread that we live in, which is why we can come into relationship with God. And notice this feast was with God. You start with him and you go with him and you close with him uh, in, in that day. Now, on the Sunday after Passover, uh, so Passover happens, feast of unleavened bread happens. On the Sunday after Passover is the next one. Verse 9, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaves of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. On the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb. Um, and it goes through the offerings uh, that are there. Uh, and also, you're still continuing unleavened bread. So, on what day did Jesus rise? On the Sunday after Passover. He is the first fruit. Uh, on the exact day. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says he is the first fruit, uh, the first of the, from the dead. Because many will come, the resurrection for uh, the church, the Old Testament saints, and then those saved uh, in the tribulation. So, so far, everything's happened on the exact day. Now we go to the next one, I'm down to uh, verse 15. 
Seven weeks in a day after the Sabbath of Passover uh, is the next feast called the Feast of Weeks. Uh, verse 15, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. And you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, uh, and then the rest of uh, the ceremony there. So what happened 50 days after? That's when the Holy Spirit came. Church was birthed. On the exact day. Um, when Ju uh, Jerusalem was jammed with people from all over the world uh, who were there. So this Feast of Weeks uh, was representing the Holy Spirit coming, the church being birthed, which was not ever thought of in prophets. Jesus mentioned it to Peter, I will build my church. Uh, but they really, uh, what, what do you mean that? Because they're still asking him at the end, what, when's the kingdom coming? Um, so it's the birthing of what God is doing now uh, through the Holy Spirit on the exact day. So there are four uh, that we've seen fulfilled all in uh, a sequence, all in the same year, all in the exact day, uh, all fulfilled by Jesus uh, and the promise. There are three more that are yet to be fulfilled. And uh, they all clustered in the fall. They're all cl clustered after uh, harvest uh, has, has been done. Uh, and the first one is over in verse 23 of Leviticus 23, is the Feast of Trumpets, or what we, we sometimes call Rosh Hashanah. Uh, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. So the next to be fulfilled is this Feast of Trumpets, celebration, trumpets being blown all day, uh, one long last trumpet at night. So people say, okay, the kids can go to bed. There's no more trumpets. Uh, they're there. But it was a two-day feast because it couldn't be declared until the high priest in Jerusalem saw the new moon. And because Israel is spread over, over a nation, not everyone could observe it when he saw it. So they'd have to send messengers out. So it was a, a two-day feast, great celebration, uh, timed with uh, when Moses brought the law the second time. You know, he had brought the first law, they were worshiping the calf and uh, all of that, and then uh, so uh, they were made, to, you know, Moses goes crazy, you know, makes them drink the gold, and he goes back up in the mountain to God. What's he going to say? What's he going to come back? What's God going to say? We've rebelled. We've gotten, what's God going to say? So when Moses came back the second time with the law, it was celebration. God is still merciful. He has not banished us. He has not done with us. And so that's the sense of um, this uh, celebration. So it's a two-day feast, uh, which uh, comes in um, usually September uh, of each year, but it's an interesting feast because um, each day ends with one loud last trumpet. Now, when 1 Corinthians, look, let's just keep your finger there and look at me for 1 Corinthians 15 for a moment, and let's just see where we see that last trumpet. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 is the classic uh, chapter in the Bible on the resurrection. Um, and Jesus is the first fruit, and then each in its turn, uh, we're going to see there's a sequence to it with Jesus, then uh, the church, and then um, at the end of the tribulation, um, people that from there. But let's look over to 1 Corinthians uh, 15, towards the end. Uh, let's pick it up in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When? At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed, for this perishable body must put on imperishable, 
This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about the rapture. He's talking about twinkling of an eye, which is pretty quick. If you look at your neighbor and twinkle, it's really quick. Um, if they're still twinkling, <laughs> even on a Monday night going on. Interesting about this uh, also is that associated with the last trumpet, most Jewish people, when they hear last trumpet, they would think Rosh Hashanah. They would think uh, this feast. It would be their language uh, in doing that. Also, you know, and I'm not saying he is, but let's say we know he's coming in 2020. What did Jesus say about it? You will not know what? The day or the hour. So that you could know the two days. But it's coming on. And maybe I, know, I haven't looked. I should have looked at the calendar when, when Rosh Hashanah 2020. Yes. But let's say, was well, he coming Tuesday or Wednesday? I don't know. Was well, he coming early or is he coming late? I don't know. But he's coming. Yeah, on time. <laughs> uh, in terms of that. So it also... There's a lot of, with the second coming of Jesus for his church, because the church is the bride of Christ, there's a lot of imagery from weddings in Jesus' day that are used in language that are used. Um, now, the, in the wedding, the feast was the responsibility of the parents of the groom. And it was big, and uh, so great uh, you know, work had to go in. But you would know about the week, but you would know which day when the feast would start. When's the wedding? Well, it's, it's getting ready. Be ready. So they even have this thing where the bride needed to be ready. And what they developed in Jesus' day, the habit was, as the father sending his son to get his bride at midnight. And so they would come with torches, the, the friend of the groom in front, and they would start going through the village with uh, coming with this bridal party or the groom party uh, coming uh, making their way to the bride's house. And they would come uh, to the bride's house uh, and say, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Well, she had to be ready. Now, you know, obviously they must have had word. They must have had word. You know, you just, uh, so she would come out at midnight. They would go back to the uh, wedding, uh, to the wedding tent and, or, or place and consume the marriage. And then the week feast would happen. So this whole imagery of, of coming to the midnight hour uh, is all of the background of what Jesus said. He's coming an hour you don't expect. He's, uh, you know, the brides uh, in uh, Matthew 25, uh, some have their oil and some don't. And they have the behold, the bridegroom comes. And those who have their oil, their lamp, they're ready, they go. Those who aren't, what happens? Loan me some of your oil. I can't. Uh, and they're left behind. Uh, all of, but all of that imagery that deals with the second coming of Christ relates to how weddings were done in that day and relates to uh, this feast of Rosh Hashanah. So, you know, Jesus can come at any moment, any time. Um, but so far, the pattern of prophecy of fulfillment is has happened on the exact day. Um, and the exact day of the feast. So, um, and, and as it says here at, at the last trumpet. So um, he might, I wish he'd come tonight, but I anticipate each Rosh Hashanah. And I think we're at the end of cycles. I think we're, I think we're at the uh, midnight hour um, that he's coming. I think God is patient. I think the gospel is going in powerful ways right now and in places you wouldn't imagine. And he's doing a harvest. And, um, and if he delays it a little, it's, he's, he's God. Um, uh, but it's coming. Let's go back to Leviticus 23. Let's see the next two and how they relate to the sequence we're looking at of the arc of um, the fulfillment of Jesus um, and bringing in the everlasting kingdom. The next after that, 10 days later, uh, is the day of atonement. Back in Leviticus 23, verse 26. So, 
Rosh Hashanah, feast, celebration, victory, the harvest is in, uh, everything is great. But for the next 10 days, they are to examine their lives. And it is all to build up to this Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, when it's a day of repentance and turning from uh, whatever sins have been uh, evidenced in your mind and heart as you sought God. Uh, and it says in verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be you a time of holy convocation. You shall afflict yourself and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people, from those who aren't doing that self-examination. And whoever does any work in a day, that person I will destroy from among the people. You should not do any work. It is a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. It should be a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves on the ninth day of the month, beginning uh, at evening, from the evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. So this day of atonement, where in the sequence does that come, uh, a prophecy? Well, Isaiah 40 says to Israel, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. That, uh, why am I doing it from memory? Let me look over to which is Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her. Her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. That she'd received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And then it's the promise of uh, John the Baptist's uh, voice coming in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, so what happens when the church is gone? G God turns his attention to Israel. Her sins are atoned for. No longer is she being sent to the nations. Now the gospel is coming to her. Uh, and um, so I believe that begins and may be when the treaty, peace treaty starts. Uh, that's there, uh, that, that day of atonement um, with um, Israel ready for salvation as a nation. Jewish people have been saved. Remember the Jewish people throughout all generations. But as a nation, as a nation, your sins are atoned for. Um, God is turning to you with salvation. And the 144,000 uh, during the tribulation represent these people who have heard the comfort of God, that he has come to forgive and cleanse and make you his own uh, and bring his spirit into you. Uh, so um, one more to happen. Uh, and then it's, uh, I think it's another 10 days, uh, 15th day or five days later. Uh, and this just, just ended in Israel, what, today? Yesterday. It's a feast of uh, booze, where it comes, where they have a, a week long where they celebrate when God dwelt with them in the wilderness, when Jesus was with them. Uh, and it says in verse 33, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, on the 15th day of the seventh month, for seven days is a feast of booth to the Lord, Yahweh. On the first day you should be a holy convocation. You should not do any ordinary work. For seven days you should present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You should not do any work. And what, what the Jewish people do is they, they make a pretend tent. They, they put string and something up where they pretend they're out in the wilderness, even in apartments in Israel, uh, remembering this, this feast uh, of Booths. Um, in prophecy, this represents then Jesus coming to earth to reign for a thousand years. And um, it's the celebration that God is dwelling with us. Uh, he has come. Uh, so in the sequence, the last one, uh, after the seven years is when Jesus comes back at the end. Now, uh, if you have a, turn to, turn to Zechariah to the end, over to, Zechariah is the next to last book of the Old Testament. So if you know where Matthew is, just go back uh, a couple of pages. Now, Jesus is Lord of Nations. Uh, Jerusalem, we're going to see, has come down. One of the interesting parts, when you get into Revelation 20 and 21, uh, and start of 22, it looks like, well, there's unsaved people around. They can't come in, but they're around. 
Uh, one of the things you need to realize is Jerusalem comes down during the thousand years, uh, as well as what is the everlasting city. Uh, and what happens is on the Feast of Booths, the nations have to come to Jerusalem and give their offerings to Jesus. Now notice what happens. Uh, let's go over to verse uh, Zechariah 14, uh, verse uh, 16. See, all, all peoples and nations aren't destroyed in, in, at the end of the tribulation. Um, there are those that survive. Uh, and it says in verse 16, as Zechariah says, then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if a family of Egypt, for example, does not go up and present themselves then on, on them, they shall have no rain. There shall be the plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not keep up the feast of booths. This should be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment to all the nations who do not go up uh, to keep the feast of booths. Uh, so this is... During this 1,000 years is the week the nations come to worship Jesus. And by the way, if you don't come, you're not going to get rain and you're going to get cursed. So it's pretty encouraging. You know, it's pretty motivating. Uh, because what happens, even though Jesus reigns for a 1,000 years, people's hearts never open. One of the strangest parts about this. But unless God opens hearts, even in a perfect seeing Jesus perfectly ruling, restoring the earth to an innocence that uh, was lost in the curse, still, uh, because when Satan, Satan is bound for these 1,000 years, when he's released, the nations instantly um, go after him. But the last of the feast uh, of the seven uh, is this feast uh, of booths. And uh, as Zechariah puts it, it represents Jesus dwelling on earth the nation's coming to bring uh, their worship to him. By the way, we're in the city. We're in Jerusalem, ruling the nations with him. Um, I don't know. Maybe you get Palace Verdes. I don't know. Um, I don't know how it's going to work. But we, we share with him. Uh, he shares with us, I should say, I'm doing that. And so when Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. And the law was a picture of me. Uh, the, I am the Sabbath rest. I am the Passover lamb. I am the unleavened bread. I am the first fruits. I am the feast of weeks. I am the one who trumpets. I am the one who will bring salvation uh, to Israel uh, and then bring my reign to earth for a thousand years. And so each of these feasts, and again, I'll give you the, the notes for this um, really next week with, Scripture references, so uh, this has been uh, a little bit much for you. So this, this whole, the Bible is a book of prophecy. From the beginning, God declares the future, which he has decided, and then works in time uh, to bring it to pass. And the seven feasts and the Sabbath um, are the picture of, uh, of that. Um, but we're almost done. Uh, how can we best capture time? Let's go back to Revelation 11. Uh, and we're going to come back next week to the three Babylons um, that, that are there. But let's go to Revelation 11. Let's just see. Um, this is Jerusalem during the seven-year period, during the tribulation. Uh, so Revelation 11, 1, John, I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, for they will trample the holy city uh, for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, time specific, um, in sackcloth. Now, what's fascinating about this uh, is that, one, during this seven year period, there is a temple. Um, Israel could do that within a month. They already have stones cut. Uh, they already have an altar, you can see, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, they already have priests they're training 
in how they already have all of the uh, thing menorah and all the things that will go in already ready. They could they could they could put that up uh, almost without uh, any question at all. And so, but it's interesting as it says measure the temple, but don't measure outside the temple, uh, for it is given over to the nations and they will trample it. So. The temple's there, but outside it belongs to um, Gentiles and to the nations. So, um, on the Temple Mount now is the Dome of the Rock, plus uh, several other uh, moths on the side as well. And um, the Dome of the Rock on Mount Moriah uh, is where Mohammed supposedly went to heaven, launched from the rock there, and got his vision of the Quran and came back. Um, as I shared a couple of weeks ago, I think, for a long time, people thought they deliberately built that right where the temple should be. And therefore, before a temple should be, uh, that has to happen. Is that going to be bombing? Is that going to be an act of God? Uh, it's kind of hollowed out underneath. There's a great fear it's just going to collapse on itself. Um, part of it's hollowed out because Israel's been digging, <laughs> establishing there. But they... That's what I understand. They've come to the conclusion it's not where the temple was. It's beside it. Um, the temple was with the golden gates there, the temple. They used to think it was offset, but now they believe as they dug underneath that it was centered to the, to the uh, golden gates. Uh, so that would enable you to have a temple right beside the Dome of the Rock. And if the treaty comes that is, Jerusalem is an international worship city, and Jews have their sites, Muslims have theirs, Christians have theirs, we're all going to live at peace, it's all the same God, we're all the children of Abraham, um, you know, it would be very easy to see, and it's curious that it would say, measure the temple, don't measure outside it. Um, if it is there built beside uh, the Dome of the Rock. Now, God has his own plans in his own ways, but uh, to me, it, it helps us get a perspective. Uh, you know, they won't allow Jewish people now on the Dome of the Rock because uh, they're afraid they're going to claim it, or prayer services, they're going to do something uh, dramatic that's there. Uh, but what, what brings peace? What brings Judaism, Islam, and Christianity uh, to have peace uh, for them and for the region? Uh, if not making which Jerusalem is the holy city for all three of those. Um, Mecca is the ultimate, but uh, Jerusalem uh, is there. Uh, it's there. So uh, I think this, this could happen with the tribulation beginning with the peace treaty, build your temple. But while they're there, the two prophets come uh, in witness uh, of Jesus. Um, you know, you can actually watch this site. There's an internet that has a camera on the temple site 24-7. Um, it's just fascinating to uh, see this. And uh, again, we see um, Jerusalem, this city, not significant among others, and yet it is the issue for peace. There's no peace for the world until there's peace in the Mideast. There's no peace for the Mideast until there's peace with Jerusalem. Uh, it has to be solved. And uh, we'll get into that next week uh, as to what that is happening. Okay, now, um, I've been asked, will there ever be a chance for questions and answers? And, um, and yes, uh, I, I just keep going, so we'll have to figure out a way to do that. But uh, maybe next week, you could, if you have a three by five card, I'll have some here. If you have questions, I can do it. And then, then we'll maybe have a time where we just open uh, open end it what's there, but you're in the midst of this. This is happening. And um, um, we're seeing one of the big key steps this last week uh, with what's happened in Syria with Russia and Iran. And stay tuned. Uh, stay tuned and look up. Look up for your redemption draw nigh. All right, let me pray. Let me pray. Uh, Father, we've, we've done a lot tonight, but it's all about how you have declared through your word what you're going to do, and you have declared the future. You're the one who declares the end from the beginning, 
And you have told us this, that you might be glorified, that we might see this and, and magnify a God who, who is able to bring this people who have been dispersed all around the world um, in the probability out of the gas ovens of, of Europe to be their own nation. And surrounded by over 300 million that, that would want to see him wiped off. And yet you have over, you've watched over them. You have protected. Your will is going to happen um, by your plan and your way. And you want us to know. You want us to know so that, so that um, we might understand our times. Because Jesus warned us. The times are so wicked. The theology will be so bad that the love of many within the church will be lost and many will fall away. You've warned us because um, you, you, you know uh, the great deception that's there. You warned us because you know with what is happening uh, in the natural world with floods and hurricanes and typhoons of historic proportions that there would be a tendency for us to be preoccupied and anxious. You don't want us to be. You want us to know because this is the last moment for the gospel so that we are using every opportunity we have to reach everyone we can um, with the good news of Jesus. And you want us to know because you're coming and you want us ready. So bless us, Lord. Give us wisdom. Continue to open this book to us um, and may it come alive. Uh, and may we sit in wonder uh, at what you're doing. Uh, and your purposes. We grieve for those who are instruments against you. We grieve for um, the ways the morality has gone and even in our own nation. But um, Lord, find us faithful. Find us living and encouraging one another here. Bless us tonight. Give us a safe journey home, a restful night, and a day and the rest of the week to glorify you and to walk with you. And we pray to all Jesus, our coming King, in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.